Shalom Aleichem. I'm Hannah Passel from Kazakhilovka. You people in America, after you've seen Fiddler in the Roof by our Shalom Aleichem, you call it Kazakhilovka because it rhymes with something, but we in Kazakhilovka know how to pronounce it. Shalom Aleichem. I mentioned Shalom Aleichem, didn't I? Well, Shalom Aleichem, our Shalom Aleichem, he was born Solomon Rabinowitz in 1850. And he came to America and he died there in 1916. In our shtetl, he was a rav, a rabbi, a very learned man. And he wrote in Hebrew like all the other writers of our town. But when he looked around and he saw the poor and the pious people and the humor and the pathos of our shtetl, he changed his name to Shulam Aleichem. You know what Shulam Aleichem means, don't you? It means peace unto you. Oh, what a Shulam Aleichem we had. He described all the people in our shtetl in Yiddish, the common language of the people. You remember Yentl the matchmaker? You remember Martel the shoemaker's son? You remember Noah Wolf the butcher and Ezreal the fisherman? He told the whole world about these people. Maybe you would like I should read something to you from some of the characters of Shulam Aleichem? All right, if you have patience, I'll read to you another thing. You know, I'm a character in fiction. Our women didn't read. We worked all day. We washed clothes. We cooked for our children. Our men didn't read anything either except the Bible. But let's pretend that I could read. Let's hear what Shulam Aleichem had to say, heir of Yom Kippur, about Ezreal the fisherman. Since the world was created, you have never seen as ill-tempered a creature as Ezreal the fisherman. An ill-tempered man with angry eyes, thick eyebrows, bristling mustache, and a beard that looks as if it had been pasted on. And he wears a quilted jacket, summer and winter, with the fringes of a chalaith cotton sticking out underneath. And he smells of raw fish a mile away. All week long, you don't see him at all. But for every Sabbath and every holiday, he appears in the marketplace with his wagon piled high with fish. On top of the wagon sits a girl with a pockmarked face watching the fish. And his wife, Meta, a heavy, swollen woman, stands alongside the wagon with a stick and watches the fish. Fish, fish, fresh and quivering, women viber fish for the Sabbath. That is the way Ezreal the fisherman announces his wares across the marketplace in his loud, familiar chant. And he never takes an eye off the women who have already crowded around his wagon and laid siege to it from all sides, clutching the fish by the heads, peering under the gills, poking at the eyes and prodding at the bellies to see if the fish is fresh. These liberties Ezreal hates and despises like something unkosher, and he chases the women away. Away from here, you poured over them long enough already. This he hurls at them in a quick undertone, and then once more to the world at large in his loud, clear chant, Fish, 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 fresh and quivering. Women, viber, fish for the Sabbath. Every woman, whether a housewife or a servant girl, is treated alike by Ezreal the fisherman. He watches her like a hawk. He does not suspect anyone of being a thief, but he knows that when it comes to fish, you never can tell. The richest, most honorable, most charitable woman is frequently torn by the desire to make off with a good fresh fish if no one is looking. Fish, he says, is a temptation that is hard for a woman to resist. Every year, at least one scandal takes place around Ezreal's wagon. He slaps some woman across the face with a wet and shiny pickerel. From all directions, men and women come running up. There is noise and confusion. The crowd puts in a word for the woman, gives her advice, tells her to file a complaint with the justice of the peace, or have Ezreal dragged off to the rabbi. 
But since the pain is moral rather than physical, it soon wears off and the whole affair comes to nothing. Most of the women know him already. They would think more of edging too close to his fish than to the gold and precious stones under the king's guard. How much are your rubies and emeralds today, a woman might ask, standing with her basket at some distance and pointing with her finger at the wagon? I deal in fish, not in rubies, Ezreal answers proudly, without so much as a condescending glance at the woman. And once more he lets out his call to the world at large, fish, fish, fresh and quivering, women, viva, fish. <laughs> An apoplectic man, the women say of him. They would rather not have anything to do with him, but that is impossible. There is not another fisherman in town, so what should one do, lay down and die? Or live through the Sabbath without fish? But that is even worse than dying. For if a woman dies, she knows she is dead. But if she comes home without fish for Saturday, oh yeah, yeah, she has a husband's wrath to contend with. And that is worse than dying. I wish something terrible would happen to him. That is what the women say when young Kippa Eve comes around. They rush off to the marketplace with their baskets, afraid that they might be too late. Because the day before young Kippa, Ezreal is in the habit of getting up so early that even God himself is in bed. And when other people are just getting ready for their morning prayers, Ezreal is through with everything and is all dressed up for the holidays. His heavy quilted jacket has been put away and he wears the coarse, shiny, black gabardine that is seen only on the Sabbath and the high holidays, but which nevertheless is saturated through and through with the odor of fish. Ezreal begins his fast earlier than anyone. Earlier than anyone he comes to the synagogue that afternoon, takes his place toward the back wall, covers his head with his prayer shawl, and stands without rest for 24 hours. He won't sit down even for a minute. He prays quietly so that no one can hear a word. He weeps a great deal, but no one can ever see a tear. But that is in the evening. Before that, all day long, he goes around the town to his customers, bringing his apologies, asking their pardon. If anything I have said to you during the year offended you, I want to apologize and wish you a happy new year. And they say to him, the same to you, Reb Israel, may God pardon us all. And they invite him to sit down, and they treat him to a piece of holiday tort. And Noah the butcher, and Getty the governor, and all the tradespeople do the same thing. They abuse us all year round. They use their offices to intimidate us, and they yell at us, and they're very high-handed. But comes Yom Kippur, they don their good clothes, and they go around and they beg the people to forgive them for their sins. And we people of Kosvilovka, we invite them to sit down and have a piece of tort with us. Hide in America. Shall I repeat that? No. You didn't hear me. Shulam Aleichem came to America and he wrote his stories and the Jews in America appreciated them and they transformed them into plays, which they played in the Yiddish Teatre and Second Avenue. And he had a very famous daughter, Bel granddaughter, Belle Kaufman, who was also a writer. And Shulam Aleichem wrote a poem himself that he asked to be written on his gravestone. And he left instructions that when he died, all he requested was that his family gather once a year and read one of his stories. And this Shulam Aleichem, this great writer of ours who wrote in our language and who gave us much laughter, wrote this. 
about himself. Here lies a plain and simple Jew who wrote in plain and simple prose, wrote humor for the common folk to help them to forget their woes. He scoffed at life and mocked the world and all its foibles, he poked fun. The world went on its merry way and left him stricken and undone. And while his grateful readers laughed, forgetting troubles of their own, midst their applause, God only knows, he wept in secret and alone. <laughs>